and they saw these three parked spheres on the big uh, flatland from a cliff they saw down in a it's a huge area with just kind of more or less flat landscape uh, no humans and they saw these three big light objects and uh, they were on a line looked like they either were parked on the snow or just hovering the, the two outmost ones started to jump like they were vibrating and then suddenly the, the center one just shoots up in the sky really high but stops and then another one comes what they describe from out from space down and just comes down to the same level chris lado welcome to lado files welcome to lado files tonight's interview is with magnus hollem he is the tech director at project Hestalen. Uh, hello magnus thanks for being here Hello, Chris. Thanks for having me. Can you just give a, a short briefing on, on what that is and what you do, your day-to-day -day ops with that? Yeah, so I, I became the technical director last year when I joined the project to be responsible for all the technical uh, equipment that are on site in Hestalen and uh, try to capture this light phenomenon and other anomalies um, that we could see there. Behind me on the background, you can see one of the most famous pictures uh, of the phenomenon from 2007 with the spectrum as well. So um, that's my responsibilities. Main maintenance of the blue box uh, automated uh, measurement station. And of course, you know, looking into all different types of instrumentation that could be useful for the research project and also you know, in close collaboration with the other scientists that are part of the project. And I also do a lot of work communicating to people, organizations, have them come here and uh, investigate the phenomenon. So I would say it's a quite a, a broad role, uh, but the focus is on the technical equipment and measurement instruments. My audience, I'm sure, is interested in hearing about the actual dive trip. So the dive investigation going on at Lake Egyptian. We have some clips here. I'll just play in the background so we can chat through them. How do you think of the overall uh, project? How did it go, your, your trip up to Lake Egyptian? Yeah, this was my third trip to last year, and uh, this is the one uh, this year. Uh, and uh, I think it went really well. It was, I would say, a very challenging, the most challenging operation because of all the organizational and logistical efforts that had to be put into it it's it's much more complicated to put di diver through the ice than just putting down a boat onto the lake and, and do some scanning with sonar and putting down an rov uh, these divers i mean this is this, this these are actually humans going down to the bottom checking you know the object and, and you're a uh, diver as well right have you done ice diving before Yes, I actually grew up close to the Arctic Circle. I took my diving certificate when I was 16, and it was a, a kind of a military-grade uh, diving certificate. And we we immediately did uh, ice uh, diving. Um, so I, I have that experience. But these divers we see here, they are really professional divers, and they have different gear. As you can see, they have a full helmet, and they are connected to this central uh, station where the dive master is located and can oversee all the parameters and, and look at the cameras and and uh, make sure that the diver is fine. You know, back in my days, I just went down through a hole and I could have disappeared. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, I survived. But this is really demanding. And also because of there is some altitude here um, mm -hmm. and just a few divers, we had a couple of rotations of about 20 minutes dives. So we were quite limited on diving time for this. Uh, only so you could only do 20 minutes per dive? Yeah, it's a little bit more, uh, just about uh, above 20 minutes. They had to, you know, um, spend some time going down and, uh, and also um, at the object, of course, and then go up. And I think um, the limitations 
I mean, it's 20 plus meters. It's not super deep, but it's 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 mm-hmm. definitely relevant in terms of uh, getting you know affected blood wise uh, by the gases that you like that toxic, you accumulate in yeah. the body. Yeah, and and uh, because of the altitude uh, as well. And and there are there are a lot of other security protocols related to these diving operations. And if we would have more divers, of course, we could just have maybe lined them lined them up and 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 have more. But uh, I mean, it's amazing what we made, you know, out of it, given the limited resources and and people we had involved in this. So this is the dive station you guys set up, right, with the computers inside of it. Yes, the dive station. I think we might see some picture of that later. But it, it's a control center, more or less, where you could see all the you know relevant um, measurements of uh, breathing and gases and pressure and and obviously the camera, uh, the the real time link uh, uplink from from the diver down there. Um, you can see it in real time. And there we have the mini rover that we sent down first, just to you know check the bottom conditions and. Uh, you know, try to, they, they needed to do that just to, you know, make sure that it looks good uh, for dive, dives uh, for, by humans. How high is the altitude? I don't remember when, when we were there. It's, uh, seven or 700, I think, meters. So it's not super high, but but it, it quickly mm. starts to affect uh, the diving tables. Um, Interesting. Uh, yeah, so it, it's not the worst case, but given that you know all the other um, circumstances are quite challenging we 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 had uh, we we need, really need to perform well during the dives to to get the results we wanted were the divers happy with their with their dives were they happy with their performance we- yeah i mean they looked i mean this was uh, they have d- d- done similar dives i mean not this topic you know, what they actually were looking for um, but they have they do all these the dives all the time both in you know salt water and fresh water i don't think ice diving is super common for them it's not uh, but they were they were they thought it was a really happy you know good experience uh, to do this and of course they were they were really happy to be part of this project because it's so rare and almost unheard of that you you go looking for something like this so you mentioned the the difficulty with the altitude and having to affect the dive table. So that limited uh, the time on the bottom. Was there any other main obstacles? You mentioned logistics as well. Um, any other big obstacles or, or difficulties you guys had? Well, uh, first of all, just you know, getting all these people together at the same spot in this uh, remote area at the same time uh, that that is in itself was a challenge. And, and you know, everybody have you know really busy schedules. We're doing it. I mean, me personally do, doing it on my spare time. Of course, these guys, it was part of their job for these days. But we were a lot of, there is a lot of people around that you never see in this footage that actually have contributed. And you're know, just getting them together and, you know, everybody contributing in, in their way and, and being a piece of the puzzle. And, and I mean, you can't expect the same like discipline and and, and uh, efforts from purely voluntarily, you know, type of engagement compared to if this was a military operation or or something like that, uh, or even a, you know, just a private enterprise. Because we are mostly a bunch of volunteers that do this in spare time. What did you guys find on the bottom? Can you just go through uh, the first, first and second dives? Yeah, so uh, we we quickly located the the object or the anomaly that we saw on sonar, um, both of the previous expeditions to Dubtron, uh, which uh, indicated a, a long cylindrical type of object on about twenty two meters depth, uh, about uh, twelve something meters long, mm. two to three meters uh, in diameter, and we quickly located that because of obviously we had the GPS position of the of the spot and uh, we made a hole you know exactly there and it was more or less exactly under the hole uh, so finding it was not a problem this time um, the divers went down they they saw um, the first thing they saw was kind of a protrusion or, or kind of a bump in the sea floor we sent the ROVs down in in October um, 
remember and yeah. they didn't see much because it's mostly under the seafloor or it has been covered by mud uh, or sediments which is kind of a good indication for for an older object uh, being there for a while so the divers they they, need, they saw that and and they looked you know went around it and they had a relatively simple um, magnetometer to check if there was any obvious readings uh, or magnetic fields or actually magnetic material I, I should say mm -hmm. they didn't see a clear indication of that uh, but it's a little bit challenging uh, it wasn't a super good detector they get quickly bulky if it was you know a lump of iron uh, we would definitely see it if it would be a bit you know non ferrous or stuff we could see it but it the signal gets weaker and there are some other you know potential disturbances that could be picked up so it was inconclusive i would say uh, but that, that was the first thing th thing that they did if it was made out of iron you would have you would have picked that up yeah most probably because that would have been a really big iron object and <clears throat> And you can argue if it was aluminum, yeah, it's it's definitely weaker. I mean, depending on the metal detector, and of course, uh, it was it. To be honest, it wasn't the best on the market uh, because we wanted to save some money and not. We had to really carefully uh, spend the money on the right places. I mean, since our goal was anyway to uncover the object and and lift it up. It didn't matter so much to us if it was metallic or not in, in the first place, because we just wanted to, to you know, retrieve it anyway. So, but then it turns out that uh, here is actually me riding the snowmobile, oh. uh, my own. Uh, it was quite a cool trip. But um, yeah, so we wanted to salvage the, the entire object, and uh, yeah, cool if it was metal, but. In any case, we just wanted to pick it up, right? Uh, but then uh, the divers, I mean, they went down and they started to kind of, you know, first with their hands to kind of get a feel of the object. I mean, really, with their hands. And they realized, oh, this is really hard beneath the, you know, immediate top sediment layer. They found this, you know, gel-like substance. They felt like it was quite unusual. You know, people that have uh, said that uh, that knows this stuff that it could form uh, in different conditions, in, in normal conditions, that kind of substance. But the hard layer around this object was uh, what it seems to be really hard packed clay or mud. That was not what we had hoped for because that means whatever it's inside there, we can't easily get to it. We need some big... Um, machinery to actually you know clean it off and we didn't have all that stuff and both the equipment and the time to actually do that but we spent as much time uh, down as we could given that the budget and the time constraint of the operation look at the object and and trying to figure out as much as we could but i mean the the and some people see this as a success some people see this as a failure to me the goal was to get down there and do as much as we could given this the constraints of operation and we did that we, we could have got stuck in you know extreme weather there could have been so much other factors we got down to the object and we concluded it was a big object uh, but we couldn't get into it so to speak and we couldn't retrieve it get it up which we didn't expect maybe at this uh, operation but I mean, there, there were so many different scenarios that, that could have happened that uh, we either could have gotten less information. And if there was, you know, just a very uh, loose clay or, or, or mud on the object, we could just, you know, scrape it off and we could immediately, like, identify, say, a human-made object or whatever, or, or something exotic or just a, you know, big uh, tree, which is highly unlikely given the data we have. So we, we, we did the best we could with the, the constraints we had. And here you see the two F-35s coming in. I would, I, I'm actually the photographer of, the, uh, of this film. And I was standing on the ice the last day. And uh, from the Norwegian Air Force, they actually stationed super, outside of Trondheim. And they wanted to salute us. We had guys on the ground, actually also Air Force uh, personnel. And uh, it was a very nice display of, I would say, collaboration and, you know, we know you guys are doing this. It's important, and, and we support you. Um, there's nothing to hide here. Yeah, very nice. And Project Heston's 
has always worked with the military, right? Is that correct? Yeah, the military actually started out in the early 80s when the kind of hairstyling phenomenon got its, you know, big attention boom. The military, first they got involved on a bit kind of, you know, shy basis, but then quite quickly, officially and, and publicly, you know, stated that they support the project. They did uh, lend out like radar equipment, uh, tracked vehicles, and they have had personnel stationed there for, for the Heston and Lights. And here we see the mar market, uh, yearly market, uh, not far from the lake where we down, uh, dived. It's a very cozy uh, thing that happens once a year in Roros, the city next to the lake. Yeah, I remember, uh, uh, remember going through Roros, hoping to be there for this trip, but couldn't make it. When you sent the ROVs down, um, were they able to um, see through the mud, I guess? How did you actually uh, get the mud out of the way? Because that was a big issue, I remember, is that if you once you stir up any sort of mud or sediment then it, it ruins all your visibility down there how did you guys deal with the mud yeah i mean th this i haven't touched upon that yet but that was really really a problem because even you know sending down that little rov you saw uh, previously stirred up some mud and especially if you want to like hover and, and look at something then you immediately you have to turn the propellers downwards right or it uh, it's it's really challenging. So when the divers went down, they were first relatively impressed by by the well relatively good uh, visibility, but once they started you know going really close to the, the object and touching you know starting to you know dig into it, then of course they steered up all this mud in and, and the visibility got got you know very low. Uh, I mean, it's hard to describe before you're there, down there yourself, what happens. Suddenly you're just in a super confusing uh, alternate universe where you don't know up from down and it's all muddy and you're supposed to do some serious work. It's really challenging. Yeah, these little fans, right? They, they were enough just to kick up the mud and then ruin visibility. Yeah, and you can imagine them divers going down trying to, you know, you know, really peel off this object or, you know, Whatever they try to do, they would immediately, and they did immediately, steer up and 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 lower the visibility. So, yeah, challenge. Okay, and then you mentioned about the gel on the object, right? So as they're scraping through, trying to get to the actual object, they found it was hard packed, and then so that gel, um, that material, you said that can form on normal natural objects. Well, yeah, I mean, it's we. What we immediately did was we contacted uh, our other partner in in the previous expedition, Nordic Subsea, um, and they that, that their experience showed that some objects that lie on the sea floor for a long time, and they are typical aluminum, they, you could have that type of gel, you know, formed around it. But since we found out that it, you know, just beneath it was. Uh, some sort of clay or really hard packed mud or whatever you call it, uh, we kind of ruled out that uh, that was kind of formed due to a metallic influence uh, on that. Uh, but really, we should uh, we have taken some samples and and uh, I haven't seen any results yet. But uh, I mean, there's just so many you know small uh, mysteries. Even I mean, we're not marine biologists. We're not underwater experts. We're, we're just you know people trying to solve this riddle of the 1947 observation of a you know object going down here. But there are so many things around this that we we really we have done some research, but we can re definitely do more uh, research around all these things. So what's the next step for? I know you guys have talked about a, another expedition. Is that what you're planning? I think uh, now, I mean, we, it, we are in the spring soon and uh, it will have to be on, on the summer. And we will, you know, get the boats there again and we will have some equipment that can really clean this object off and, and, the, and the surrounding and we can lift it up. With a, You have to get under it or touch something that can have a buoyancy and just float it up or have wires going directly underneath it and a crane on a boat. We, we have uh, plans for that because we want to get uh, to the bottom in a, several aspects with this. And this is, I think, will be the most logical way to, to continue this search. Oh, excellent. And are there any other main projects going on at Project Heston that you want to relay yeah. to the audience? 
Definitely. I mean, I would say that this, even though this is a really, I would say, extraordinary, I, I'm so happy to have been involved in Operation Arctic Seals and, and the two previous uh, search operations because it's a true mystery. I mean, you, Chris, you made a great coverage of the ghost rocket phenomenon. You have to really dig into that and understand that there is so much high strange, strangeness in these observations. And so physical. I mean, they actually splash down. There is no doubt that things splash down uh, and sink. And where are the objects? And what are the objects? It, it's really such a huge mystery. And I really wanted to be part of solving or, or at least, you know, shedding some light on that. But for Project Hastal and the main uh, task and, and the goal is to actually find, find out what uh, the Hastal and Lights phenomenon is all about. Uh, which is a huge mystery in itself. It's probably one of the longest lasting hotspots of uh, anomalies, aerial anomalies in the world. And uh, people that know a lot about other such places, a few of them exist. Many, several of them uh, hints that they think still the Heston is the weirdest one just because of the, I would say, the enormity of of variation and complexity in these uh, objects, how they have interacted. I mean, we're talking about complex geometrical formations and on and off, reacting to radar, reacting to uh, lights and lasers and, and uh, hiding away, according to observers at least, hiding away when airplanes go over. And I mean, even if you, it's just, you know, a few percent of it is true. We know a lot of this is true because it's on film and all and instruments. But it's it's a super big mystery, and there are several aspects of that. It's the where where is the energy from? What kind of process it's behind this? Is there something more than just unknown physics here? We're talking. Uh, are we talking about any time of intelligence? Like we have, you know, previously touched on t uh, plasma intelligence, and and there there it's just wide open, and and uh, I invite any scientist or any actually scientific minded person you don't have to be a scientist necessarily but just come here and try to do research um, and you know chris one of my favorite uh, topics uh, in in project has done is drones i think that i honestly believe believe that uh, the modern drone technology is the, is at least a very crucial component in at least trying to solve the mystery because the, ch the challenge has been all the time, we are not close enough to the, to really see what's going on in these lights because they have a structure and you, you quickly burn out uh, the, the pixels on the camera because it's so bright. You need to have really, you know, well thought through high tech equipment uh, with uh, like high dynamic, ray, uh, dynamic ranges. And I mean, for example, measuring magnetic field, it just dies off so quickly from any object ever uh, sending out a man man magnetic field that uh, if you're very close to it, you can much with much higher signal to noise ratio tell if this object is magnetic. And magnetism is really interesting in both. I would say semi-natural or, well, relatively natural explanation, like some kind of plasma uh, vortex or whatever being charged, say being charged by the natural battery that some people think uh, think exists and has stolen. Um, and then you have all these much more exotic uh, things that could potentially um, emit in a ma magnetic field that could be detected, but you need to get close. And I mean, these are ob these ob big move. So, and they're in there, so why should we not be in there and move? I think that's mm -hmm. the, just the logic of it. Uh, we need to be in the same element and be able to do the same thing as these objects. Of course, we would not chase the objects that go like Mark III or something, which has been detected. That would be you know, impossible, well, very hard. But then there are these objects. I mean, they cruise around very, very slowly. I mean, if they would be at you know ground level, you could reach up and touch them. But nobody has been that close. But um, re people have been like, I would say, like 20, 30 feet away from them. So in any case, mostly they are at some altitude, not super high. Uh, I think it's perfect for, for drone technology. And therefore, I also invite anyone. Uh, I mean, my plan is to have a, a, a very accurate sensor network on the ground that could trigger alarms, triangulate, and find out the location of, of a suspected anomaly. Uh, or outlier, whatever you call it, 
and then it triggers an autonomous drone that can go up all year has to be in a hangar because of the winter and stuff go up and it can actually go uh, towards the location you know uh, a lot of uh, these drone hunters type of drones for example that they also have onboard radar they have small miniature radars that could actually track and you know keep them locked on objects uh, in the air i mean like a fighter yet like uh, you used to do but and drones can do that today so i think that's what i want to do if you look at the terrain too it's there's not a lot of roads and a lot of this terrain you can't access without snow machines even right like as parts of heston yeah. you can't reach without a snow machine or snowmobile yeah i mean Hestalen has one main road going from north to south, more or less. Then you end up in the two lakes, and then that, that's the end of the road. And um, we have indication. I mean, Hestalen is, is relatively narrow north to south, but we have uh, historical indications, and, and actually uh, my own film uh, that shows that, well, indicates that to the west of Hestalen, uh, it's just wasteland. Well, not wasteland, but it's it's like I would say highland type of uh, wet uh, ground, highlands. There are just few hiking paths, trails yeah. you can go. Absolutely no vehicles allowed. Na natural reserve. Mm. And I mean, the, one of the 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 most uh, I would say talking uh, observation we have on record is the one from 1982 when these three uh, guys from Hestal and finally decides to that they are you know we need to find a source of this light and they have seen that light jumps over the western uh, northwestern mountain called Fins of Högda uh, that they jump over the mountain and go on the other the western side and they decided mm -hmm. to take the snowmobiles like here and actually I'm not that far away here uh, when I drive this one but uh, and three of them guys and they were all skeptical because it was just the start of the first uh, wave. And they went, I think they drew in 20 kilometers or something. They had to go around because there are some high high grounds where you can't drive. To the west part of, of today you're not allowed to go snowmobiling there, uh, to mm -hmm. the west of Hestalen. Um, and they saw these three parked spheres on the big uh, flatland from a cliff they saw down. In a, it's a huge area, with just kind of more or less flat landscape, uh, no humans. And they saw these three big... Uh, light objects and uh, they were on a line looked like they either were parked on the snow or just hovering and then they started the, the two outmost ones started to jump like they were vibrating and then suddenly the the center one just shoots up in the sky really high but stops and then another one comes what they described from out from space down and just comes down to the same level uh, and then the second one, the first one just flies away, like they're, you know, sinking something. And then the new one goes down and takes the exact same spot to the first one. And, and uh, the old one just fly, fly, flies into space, it looks like. And then they see it. One of these objects, they see what they describe. There were no, like, headlamps, uh, really usable headlamps uh, in 1982. It's not, not at least here. Um, uh, but now uh, they have described it like they were, like, suddenly like a thousand small lights showed up and started like rotating around this sphere. And what they saw in this light, because they had binoculars, so they saw they saw structure, they saw what they think is metallic, and they saw what they think is look like windows. They even describe, you know, there is this old style windows that have these uh, wooden uh, beams uh, in the window to make it like smaller windows forming a big one. And uh, they saw some kind of, I would say, uh, great. I mean, really. And they actually observed this for two hours. I had a four-hour chat with the only, only one surviving this is uh, Jon Arvid Aspros, and he's the guy who said, if there's anything I regret, it's not shooting at them. That's the guy. And he's, no, the, okay. <laughs> he's the only survivor of the three. And what is very well documented is that all three of them had more or less exact, exact same story. And it deeply affected all three of them, deeply. All the people around them could, you know, testify that whatever happened, whatever they saw out in this remote place, nobody's there. There is no roads, there is no nothing. It's just, you know, open, empty, kind of mountainous terrain. Uh, and in this 
particular, I, I would say if anyone or anything ever would like to, in, in mid-Norway at least, hide and, and have a nice landing spot or whatever to just, you know, relax for a while, and not have humans around, uh, th this would be a very, very good spot. You captured a, a light uh, on the, on the, a Heston light in the distance. Have you made any more captures with all the, the cameras you put out? I have made a few, but not as clear as that one. Uh, I made some some uh, that I might be, you know, uh, either satellite star or or maybe an aircraft that is not like you have the military NATO aircraft fly without, uh, you know, a transponder on. You can mm -hmm. just see the flashes, the strobes. Um, not as clear that that one that I just got, you know, two days after put up the camera, but. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I have not had a functional detection system on it. On the other hand, it's just the, I mean, that one I just captured when entering by by coincidence manually into the system, and just panning it with a with a control on the, my mobile phone. So, uh, but I'm just uh, uh, about to to get um, the UFO app running on it. Um, okay. Actually, and there are some other good news. Um, in terms of um, a collaboration. So n this week and in just a few days, I will go to Hastalen and um, uh, a representative of uh, Würzburg University will come there and we will together install uh, new cameras and then AI-based detection system for UAPs. Oh, interesting. That's just in a few days. The neural network is not fully trained, but this is uh, perfect for actually training it as well. I mean, you get... Yeah, you get some false alarms, but that's how you train a network, right? Um, you label that as false or, or irrelevant. And then, and this is a super, I would say, fantastic next step. They have developed this system for many years. This is the like uh, fourth version or something. And finally, we get to deploy it in Hastal. And, you know, the capture I did was on the, from the blue box, looking west. Actually, it was looking exactly in the direction that this three guy, gentlemen in the snowmobile saw these three spheres. Um, so it's to the west. But you cannot cover whatever you are in Hastalen or the surrounding mountains. The, the, the view is always obscure by some kind of peak somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and you really need to have a multi-location to cover a relevant area of the, the valley. And um, this is what we want to do. We, we just we don't just want one station. We, we want we want multiple uh, locations where we can detect and track the light and also triangulate and get uh, position. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, and uh, anyone that wants to contribute, please uh, do that. We have done a lot of work, put a lot of work into making the Hastalen phenomena much more you know well known and. It was already pretty known, but maybe because of you know people have forgotten about it, or if you don't get regular updates, you you maybe it's not that relevant. But we we're really trying to because the, we know the phenomenon is there. We have multiple observations from previous year, and we they are still there. I mean, we we know they're pretty sure, and uh, we want to solve solve the mystery, which it might even be unsolvable. We don't know, but we have to try, right? Excellent. Yeah, I, remember, uh, I interviewed Massimo Teodorani, uh, and it's it's so interesting about the lights. You mentioned you're just, you know, you're, you're you're so far away. It's hard to get actual good detection data. But he mentioned it. it we, you're seeing black body radiation. You know, where you're you're expecting to see, um, like spectrums, kind of like those lines behind you. Yeah, exactly uh, that. that. You see These black body. There. You see yeah. that they go from red to blue quite smoothly you at least cannot see any clear um you know um, hole in the spectrum which means it's a very broad spectrum type of radiation in the most temperature ranges you could think of a thermoplasma you see the the emission lines from these the gases that are involved right yes and to, and to get it that broad spectrum it has to be i mean to my understanding, oh, I'm not a plasma physicist, but I think it has to be ultra hot. I mean, so hot it's you cannot even, you know, contemplate it to even, you know, do that. Or it has a fundamentally different uh, emission process than actually just recombination of electrons in a, in, a, in an ionized gas or plasmified gas. But th there are uh, there are some 
I think uh, very theoretical models that could maybe explain a very broad spectrum type of plasma, that's possible, but nobody has proven any, any of this. So it's still up for, <laughs> for research, definitely. It's like, I mean, Massimo put it in, Massimo, by the way, is in the project and, and uh, a good friend of my, mine, and he put it really nicely in a paper before 2010 that it looks like there's mini stars flying around in, in Hastalen. And, and that's a really interesting um, perspective that it looks like to be starlight. But th there is one but here is that no really high resolution spectrometer has been uh, deployed. And this is what we want to do. This is one of the key research uh, goals is that, okay, let's say we have this detection, basic detection sh system. We could, you know, uh, get an uh, you know, event based system, trigger an alarm when it detects an anomaly. And then we have a pan and tilt rig with a tele ob object, tele lens, and um, with a grating and a, at least a medium re resolution grating. And it could swing. It's it's a bit of a mass to swing, and it's it's a bit you know you have to have strong motors to you know compensate for the for the acceleration of all that stuff. But since we know a few of these lights move slowly, I think it's very doable. And then they have a very close up from a lens, uh, uh, tele lens, mm -hmm. and then you could get the spectrum in a slitless uh, spec spectrometer where you don't have to have the object exactly in the slit, which is mm. would be very hard uh, from a kind of control perspective, uh, but just have it within the frame. And I think we could do that with not, you know, super expensive stuff. But if you want a true high resolution spectrometer, it gets really heavy and super expensive, but a medium one is, and it's still magnitude so better than the ones like you see behind me. That was just yeah. a grating on, on a camera, on a typical, you know, standard camera. So if we get that, we could see maybe the fine structure of this light uh, from a spectral point of view. And that could reveal surprises that, oh my God, this is actually maybe both a seemingly continuous spectrum on low resolution, but, but, but then if you look harder, you see the peaks and then you could immediately start to try to identify elements and excitation levels and all of that. There is a, another dimension here, and that's uh, time, because we have indications from previous research that these lights can flash and they can change light characteristics in a very short time frame. So that means that you want to have very short exposure time, both actually for the spectrum and, 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 and for the optical pictures, because you want to see if there is change in, 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 in any kind of structure and Parameters. Massimo took a really nice, uh, during the research uh, in Hastol in 2002, he took this famous triangle light photo. It looks like a triangle of light with one red light. And and it actually takes, he he he, he actually takes a couple of shots of it uh, forming light objects coming together. I like to call them light objects uh, coming together and forming a, a formation and just hovering over the treetops. He, he took that picture, that this series of picture. Uh, so we know they are highly dynamic, like the type one lights that, you know, some people say, you know, I, I don't think I've seen Heston lights, but I have a feeling I've seen it because, you know, in the peri peripheral vision, you have a higher for a short pulses. And it's a very ro low resolution, but you can not notice that something happened. And a lot of people have said that, that, you know, I have this feeling that there was like someone with a, Flash lamp, just a flash, the right? Flash bulb, yeah. I have seen something that I think is that is in Haslam as well. It's just that, wait a minute, I just barely registered that something flashed, but I can't, you know, I can't find anything. Also, when it comes to other research areas in Haslam, I would say that we have uh, some indication of uh, serious uh, drone uh, malfunctions in Haslam. I think this need this warrants some investigation. Um, because drones are actually a flying multi-sensor platform with, uh, you know, accel accelerometers and uh, infrared altimeters. And I have seen the drone data from a, a drone that indicates an object directly under the drone, even the drone is very, you know, uh, high up, well, relatively high up, about three tops height. and. And um, um, it actually starts to try to initiate a landing sequence in midair. And this is not just a glitch. It seems to go on for a specific area. 
So I would like to, you know, challenge anyone that has instrumental drones to come to Hestalen and try to map out any anomaly. And I mean, we have our colleague Rune who flew drone there, and it, the drone got crazy. And he says he, he never, he, you know, has a lot of experience, many years as a drone pilot, and uh, he never saw anything like it. The drone went bananas, like it was so it flew into something or something took control of the drone. Oh, cool. And then, finally, you mentioned the UFO DAP. Um, have you deployed many of those? What, what do you think of that system? Uh, well. I have not. I'm on the way on my way to deploy the first one. Okay. So I will try to run that, and that's in parallel to this Würzburg uh, AI-based camera detection system because that's the university built. But I think that we should have several parallel sensor systems anyway. Well, well, excellent, Magnus. Seems like a exciting stuff going on. Thanks for the update on the Arctic seals. It looks like uh, you guys went down. You found the object. Uh, you determined it's not uh, made out of iron. It's not just a big slab of iron. You got this weird gel, so the samples are getting um, analyzed now. You guys are going through uh, the samples, and then you have another trip planned for the summer to hopefully get some heavy equipment down there and actually lift up whatever object is at the bottom. So that's exciting. But I know you're you're personally excited about all the other projects, putting out the the additional cameras out here and the in the hills of Hestalen, and then hopefully getting drones to get closer to the objects, get into their, their actual environment. And like you mentioned, drones are their own sensors. They have their own sensors built into them. You can also get data from that. So exciting stuff going on at uh, Project Hestalen. Anyone can go to hestalen.org uh, for their website. And so I'd ask anyone that's interested uh, to go to the website, check it out, and get involved like uh, these volunteer yeah, UAP hunters out here up in uh, the cold of Norway. I mean, you guys weren't getting paid for this. It's all on your on your own dime and your own time. So, yeah, I'd want to say, yeah, thanks, thanks for doing this. I uh, hope you uh, continue in all the success, Magnus. Thanks. Uh, I enjoyed being on the show, Chris. Always, and uh, let's do it again soon. Um, I'm sure we will have some nice results to share. Uh, I hope so, at least uh, within not too far in the future. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Magnus. Exciting stuff going on at Project Hestalen. So I encourage everyone to go check out the, the website, hestalen.org, and get involved if you are interested. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Leto for exclusive content. Uh, you can also become a YouTube member, and it really helps to hit the like button if you did like this video and subscribe to hear those updates when we hear from Magnus again. So thanks for being here. Have a great day. Peace.